This series of lectures focuses on the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses, and of course we're going to talk about the anterior skull base while we're here as well. You have on each side four sets of paranasal sinuses. You've got your frontal sinuses in your forehead, you have the maxillary sinuses in your cheeks, you have the ethmoid air cells between your eyes, and you have the sphenoid sinus buried in the center of your skull. There's several different ways that we can image the paranasal sinuses. Historically, we have used conventional radiographs, although that's no longer standard of care. Uh, computed tomography is the workhorse for imaging the paranasal sinuses and is our default go-to modality. And magnetic resonance is still useful in particular clinical circumstances. First, let's talk about conventional radiographs. There are several different frontal projections that constitute a standard set of sinus images. These frontal projections are differentiated by the relative location of the petrous apex to the facial bones. For example, in this project, in a Caldwell view, the petrous apex projects over the bottom of the orbits. This is very useful for looking at the frontal sinuses, and you're looking right down the barrel of the ethmoid air cells there. So useful for frontal and ethmoid sinuses. Unfortunately, the maxillary sinuses are obscured by the petrous apex. The waters view solves that problem. In the waters view, the head is tilted a little further back, and you can see that the petrous apex is way, way down here now and no longer obscures our visualization of the maxillary sinuses. So the waters view is really good at looking at the maxillary sinuses. Just to be complete, let me also talk about the other frontal projections that are not a routine part of sinus imaging. If the petrous apex projects way up over the top of the skull, that's called a town's view. If it projects over the top of the orbit, that's called an angiographic AP. If it projects over the center of the orbit, that's a standard AP. Uh, and you may accidentally acquire some of those projections even when you're trying to get sinus films. If you tilt the head all the way back and project from underneath the chin with the film on the top of the patient's head, that's called a submental vertex view, or sometimes called a modified basal view. This is good for looking at the sphenoid sinuses. You can just see the walls of the sphenoid sinuses. Now you're looking right through the nasopharynx, so don't be confused by the air column in the nasopharynx. You're looking for this line right there that is the posterior border of the sphenoid sinus. And this one, this projection here, wait for it, this one is the lateral. It's good for the frontal sinuses and, uh, and a bit for the maxillary sinuses. Now, having gone through the conventional radiologic imaging of the paranasal sinuses, I'm going to tell you that it is, it is a total waste of time. Nobody should be doing conventional radiographs for the sinuses. Uh, you'll still see people who trained a long time ago who feel like uh, this is an appropriate technique or people who learned from a mentor who hadn't realized that the standard of care has changed, but it's no longer the standard of care. At the end of every report that I dictate on conventional radiographs of the sinuses, I include the following phrase, CT is the preferred modality for the evaluation of the paranasal sinuses. Now, that may torque some people, but I think we need to educate the referring clinicians. Okay, let's move on to CT, which is really what we're using to image the sinuses. There used to be some controversy about the use of direct coronal imaging versus reconstructed coronal imaging based on axials. Uh, you do co direct coronal imaging by hanging the patient's head off the end of the table or by putting them uh, prone and extending the neck 90 degrees this means that you have placed their coronal anatomy into an axial plane from the reference point of the scanner, and so you can get direct coronal images. Uh, this was a, uh, a conundrum back when reconstructed coronal images from axial plane were still rastery. I think at this point everyone just does reconstructed coronal imaging for the paranasal sinuses. I will note, however, that if you are imaging the anterior skull base and you want to get a precise look for bony gaps in the anterior skull base, 
direct coronal imaging still has a role. It is still more precise in its evaluation of the cribriform plate and fovea ethmoidalis, which we'll talk about later. Low-dose scans, this also used to be controversial. We were worried that if we did low-dose scanning of the paranasal sinuses that we would miss something in the soft tissue because you lose a lot of soft tissue resolution with low-dose scans. You can still see the bones well, but you lose the soft tissue. Research has shown that it is extremely rare for us to uh, find pathology that we would overlook under those circumstances. So I think everyone's pretty comfortable now with low-dose scans. Of course, you need to make sure that you use good reconstructions, good bone reconstructions, and proper windowing to ensure that you're getting a really good look at fine bony detail. You don't want broad windows. You want really, really uh, focused windows that will let you look at the, uh, at the bones, at thin, thin little bones of the paranasal sinuses. MRI has very particular uses in the paranasal sinuses. It is used to assess tumor extension in patients who have known uh, malignancies, and it is sometimes useful in the setting of fungal disease like mycetomas um, or invasive fungal sinusitis, and we'll talk about that uh, on a future slide. Let's turn our attention to the anatomy. We'll talk about the paranasal sinuses themselves. We'll talk about the anatomy of the nasal cavity and the anterior skull base. Uh, we'll talk about the drainage pathways for each of the sinuses. And we'll talk some about nearby structures that might affect the paranasal sinuses or vice versa that might be affected by disease of the paranasal sinuses. Here's a coronal CT through the center of the nasal cavity. The nasal septum runs right down the center, dividing the nasal cavity in half. On each side, there are three turbinates filling the nasal cavity. Underneath each of, this, each of these turbinates, that is lateral to the, the bulk of the turbinate, is a corresponding meatus. So we have a superior, middle, and inferior turbinate. And deep to those, we have a superior, middle, and inferior meatus. The floor of the nasal cavity is the hard palate, and the lateral walls of the nasal cavity are the medial walls of the maxillary sinuses. The roof of the nasal cavity is the anterior skull base, and we'll talk about that in more detail. When we're talking about the anterior skull base, we're essentially talking about the olfactory apparatus and its surrounding bones. For example, this is the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate is where the first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, sends little projections down into the nasal cavity that enable us to smell. Right? The cribriform plate is a horizontally oriented bone that forms the medial aspect of the roof of the nasal cavity. Parallel to the cribriform plate is another horizontally oriented bone, the fovea ethmoidalis, or the roof of the ethmoid air cells. The, this bone will continue on back and become continuous with the planum sphenoidale once we get behind the ethmoid air cells and into the roof of the sphenoid sinuses. The vertical piece of bone that connects the cribriform plate to the fovea ethmoidalis, that vertical piece of bone is called the lateral lamella, the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate. The lateral lamella normally has a couple of defects in it that are for the anterior and posterior ethmoid air cell, so not all gaps in the lateral lamella are abnormal. Right down the center is the crista galli. It separates the two olfactory grooves from one another. As we discussed, there is a normal gap in the lateral lamella for the anterior ethmoidal artery. Now, the anterior ethmoidal artery is running from the orbit through the ethmoid air cells, sometimes just above the ethmoid air cells, across the lateral lamella and into the olfactory groove. You don't often catch it in its entire length like this. I, I chose a, a, a picture that would show it it's in, in its entire length. Usually it's a little oblique to the angle of imaging, and so you pick it up along its course. It's usually most evident, though, as it pierces through the lateral lamella, 
Now that we've talked about the bones, let's talk about the associated soft tissue. This area right here, this cup formed by the crystagalli, the cribriform plate, and the lateral lamella, that is the olfactory groove. The first cranial nerve is running right down the olfactory groove, and it widens to form the olfactory bulb anteriorly. On the other side of the cribriform plate, this is the olfactory cleft. This is part of the nasal cavity. It is normally filled with gas. The olfactory groove is filled with CSF and a nerve, and the olfactory cleft is filled with air. The olfactory cleft is sometimes referred to as the olfactory recess. Those are synonyms. Now let's talk about the drainage pathways for these sinuses. All of the sinuses produce mucus. That mucus has to drain out through the from the sinuses into the nasal cavity. And so the drainage pathways that allow the mucus out are very important to our analysis. The maxillary sinuses drain through the osteomiatal complex. The frontal sinuses drain through the frontonasal recesses, sometimes called the frontal recess. The sphenoid sinuses drain through the sphenoethmoidal recess. And the ethmoid air cells, they catch as catch can. Sometimes they'll join in and the anterior ethmoid air cells will, will, be, will uh, drain into the osteomedal complex. Uh, the posterior ethmoid air cells may drain into the sphenoethmoidal recess, or they may drain independently into the nasal cavity without joining in with the other sinuses. So they're a little less predictable. However, what is predictable about the ethmoid air cells is the division between anterior ethmoid air cells and posterior ethmoid air cells. By definition, the anterior ethmoid air cells are the ones that drain into the middle meatus, and the posterior ethmoid air cells are the ones that drain into the, the sphenoethmoidal recess and the superior meatus. Here's an example of the osteomiatal complex. Every sinus has an os. That's the hole through which the mucus escapes, and all the cilia that are lining each sinus are beating the mucus, pushing it towards that os. So it starts at the os, and then there is a long, thin tube called the infundibulum, and then the hole at the other end of the tube, where it dumps into the nasal cavity, is called the hiatus semilunaris. The bone that forms the medial aspect of the infundibulum is called the uncinate process. All of this taken together is the osteomiatal complex. The osteomiatal complex drains into the middle meatus. How about the frontonasal recesses? Here's the frontal sinus, here's its drainage pathway, and the frontonasal recess is coming down and it too drains into, eventually, the middle meatus. Notice how some of these anterior ethmoid air cells are joining in. They're joining the frontonasal recess. That's normal. As long as an air cell is headed towards the middle meatus, we'll call it an anterior ethmoid cell. The sphenoethmoidal recesses are more posterior. Here you can see the sphenoid sinus draining through the sphenoethmoidal recess, and you see that we end up here in the superior meatus. Here are a couple of posterior ethmoid air cells joining in. Same thing on the other side. Most of the anatomy that we're looking at in the nasal cavity is best seen in the coronal plane, and that's why we've been talking about uh, the coronal CT images. But the sphenoethmoidal recess is perhaps better analyzed on axial images. Here's an axial image that I think better shows the sphenoethmoidal recesses. Here's the sphenoid sinus. There's the os of the sinus. Here's the sphenoethmoidal recess, and you can see some of the posterior ethmoid air cells joining in there. Right, sphenoethmoidal recess, if you're having any trouble finding this structure on coronal images, axial images will come through for you. We've sort of been alluding to where these drainage pathways end up, but let's go ahead and be explicit about it. 
The maxillary sinuses end up in the middle meatus. The frontal sinuses end up in the middle meatus. The anterior ethmoid air cells in the middle meatus. That's our cluster for the middle meatus. The posterior ethmoid air cells, by definition, end up in the superior meatus, and so does the sphenoid sinus end up in the superior meatus. Okay, that's all of our sinuses. I, I feel like the inferior meatus is kind of left out here, right? Nothing's going to the inferior meatus. Not to worry. The nasolacrimal duct is what dumps into the inferior meatus, and that is why your nose runs when you cry. Let's talk about some of the nearby structures that can affect or be affected by the paranasal sinuses. The carotid artery uh, runs alongside the sphenoid sinuses. The pituitary gland sits on top of the sphenoid sinuses. The orbits are out lateral to the ethmoid air cells. The pterygopaltine fossa, we're going to talk a lot about that. We've already talked a little bit about the hard palate. It's just the floor of the nasal cavity. And we've talked about the nasal lacrimal duct along the lateral aspect dumping into the inferior meatus, the optic nerve, uh, also uh, near the sphenoid sinuses. Let's run through these. The carotid arteries run adjacent to the sphenoid sinuses. Now I've chosen to show an image here where there is atherosclerotic disease so that the carotid arteries show up well on the bone window. This and this, those are the anterior clinoid processes. So the carotid arteries are running right here between the anterior clinoid process and the sphenoid sinus. Every once in a while, this bony plate that separates the carotid artery from the sphenoid sinus becomes very thin. And endoscopically, you may even be able to see pulsations of the carotid artery. If this has a lot of mucosal disease and someone's doing surgery, that carotid artery could be at risk. So we want to make sure that we we can always see an intact wall of the sphenoid sinus separating it from the carotid arteries. If it's thinned, we need to bring that to the attention of the surgeons to avoid a catastrophe. The optic canals. The optic canals are here and here, and they're carrying the optic nerves from the orbit into the intracranial vault. Notice that the optic canal is right next to the anterior clinoid process and adjacent to the sphenoid sinus. And you're saying to yourself, that's exactly how you just described the carotid artery. And in fact, the, uh, the, the internal carotid artery and the optic canal run right near each other along the lateral superior aspects of the sphenoid sinuses. Here's the same anatomy in the axial plane. You can see the optic canal and its proximity to the sphenoid sinus. This is really important for infections that may spread into the optic canal or if there's a fracture through one of these walls a hematoma in the optic canal. The optic canal is an incredibly tight space. It's the bottleneck of the uh, optic nerve. And so a little bit of pathology goes a long way in crushing those optic nerves. These are emergent findings because an optic nerve that is under pressure for any substantial length of time will never recover. So surgical emergency when we see something affecting those optic canals. The pituitary gland has a predictable location at the top of the clivus. This triangular bone is the clivus on this midline sagittal image. Here's the sphenoid sinus. The sphenoid sinus pneumatizes to a variable degree. Sometimes the sphenoid sinus is just sitting anteriorly, barely even touching the cella tersica. Sometimes, like in this example, it wraps about halfway around the cella tersica. Sometimes you get a very well pneumatized sphenoid sinus and it wraps all the way around up into the dorsum cella and completely surrounds the pituitary gland. All of these are normal relationships between the cella tersica and the sphenoid sinus. The nasolacrimal duct, we've alluded to this before, the nasolacrimal sac begins on the medial side of the orbit. It extends down as a vertically oriented duct and dumps into the inferior meatus. Sometimes the nasolacrimal duct is entirely filled with fluid tears. Sometimes there's a little bit of gas. Both of those are normal. No big deal. This concludes part one of the lecture on imaging of the paranasal sinuses.